Well, thank you very much. Does it matter which one of these I use? I don't know. Um, so neurotechnology is a relatively new field and also one that is exploding. You'll hear about it over and over again, uh, more and more in the press. And it is uh, a field that has very high ambitions. Its goals are to do things like cure paralysis, blindness, depression, and memory loss. But not through drugs, but by using a combination of neuroscience knowledge, how the brain works, and combining it with technology, not only to treat brain disorders, but also to even make replacement parts that can fix the broken brain. So the, there have been really some spectacular successes in this field already. One is the cochlear implant. It's allowed about 250,000 people, including a large percentage of them children, to hear again. They have useful hearing as a consequence of this little device that can be placed inside their ear uh, and stimulate their brain. The, uh, the, However, a lot of the, the really creative ideas that are emerging from universities are languishing in the laboratory because to produce something as complex as a neurotechnology, a device that interfaces with the brain, you need to combine neuroscience and uh, technologists, engineers, clinicians. And this is enormously complex. It requires a different kind of culture than we're used to. And it requires uh, the, the enormous resources to, to carry off. So, uh, last year, uh, what I want to talk about is last year I left uh, a very comfortable position as a professor and neuroscience researcher for 30 years at Brown University to establish a really a new and unique model of being able to bring the ideas of how to use neurotechnology to treat human disorders uh, to uh, a much more accelerated pace and a much more efficient pace, pace that brings together these various cultures. So what I want to do is start from my own personal pers perspective to develop a brain-computer interface, uh, which we call BrainGate. So let me, let me explain what this is. So you're seeing Matt. That's Matt Nagel. He's a guy in his 20s. He's playing a video game. And uh, he's supposed to hit the treasure chests and avoid the goblins, which are the little squares. Now, you'd say for a guy in his 20s, you know, that he's not a very good gamer. Well, in fact, Matt has had a really uh, terrible spinal cord injury that has disconnected his brain from his body. So he's completely paralyzed. He can think about moving, but he can't move his arms or his legs or any part of his body at all. So what is he doing? Well, what we did is we developed a tiny device about the size of a collar button. Uh, that's that little array of electrodes. It looks like a little hairbrush. A neurosurgeon put that into Matt's brain in the part of the brain that actually creates your intention to move your arm. And uh, we are able to take that signal out put it into a computer and we have the ability to translate his thoughts about wanting to move that cursor into the actual movement of the cursor, a language that the computer can understand and allows him independence that uh, he never had. So this was the, the, the beginning of a brain-computer interface. This was uh, uh, 2006. And I realized, actually, as I came here, this was bookended by Wired Stories. Matt was uh, interviewed and actually played Pong with a Wired US uh, 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 reporter. And uh, now jump uh, really 10 years ahead, also covered in a Wired story. You saw Kathy at the beginning there uh, in, in the Wired story from, from uh, Wired here. And uh, Kathy is a person who is uh, completely paralyzed due to a stroke, actually 10 years before this, uh, this video took place. And now we're not having uh, her move a cursor on a screen, but she's actually using her thoughts to control a, a robotic arm. And so she can move, she's moving that robotic arm merely by thinking about it. And what she's doing is, for the first time since she had her stroke, she's able to feed herself her morning coffee. In other words, she can do it on her own without having somebody bring her the coffee, hold it in front of her mouth, and let her drink. So in some sense, this is a really amazing accomplishment. But to me, 10 years of development, and we're going from cursors to robotic arms. So what, what you know, do we have a product? Do we have something that's really developing? Well, let me just let you peek in on, and we'll just show you uh, first, uh, Kathy's response to be able to do this was really, I think, an iconic image that's captured all over the internet. But, but let me show you what the scene really looks like. You know, it's, it's a lab. Uh, you can see that Kathy has a plug on her head that the surgeon had placed there. There's a technician that's connected that kind of a box, which is amplifiers and electronics. It goes to other boxes, goes to that cart of computers that does the translation which then goes by other wires over to a robotic arm. This is definitely not a product. 
So in one sense, I feel very proud that we developed something. In the other sense, I said, we don't have anything that's really out there in the world that's really helping people. How can we convert that into a, uh, into a product? And a lot of people worked a long time to get this far. So what's our vision? So what I want to do is show you a quick animation that uh, will last just a minute, but it gives you the idea of the vision of what we want to do as a person where somebody who's paralyzed, you don't recognize them as being paralyzed. They're just doing everyday things in the world, but have a technology that allows them to reconnect their brain back to their body. So I'll let this charming uh, British accent woman uh, explain the idea to you. The V Center is developing new technology that will enable people to reactivate paralyzed limbs through thought. This system consists of a tiny microelectrode array which is implanted on the brain surface. This array is connected to a communication unit which sits on the skull beneath the skin. When the person thinks about moving, this implant transmits the intent wirelessly to an external processing unit worn on a belt. Here, signals from the brain are interpreted and relayed to a small pacemaker-like device which is connected directly to a nerve cuff electrode. The unit stimulates the nerve which activates muscles to turn thoughts into action. So, so this kind of technology goes from brain to technology and back to the nervous system or back to the body again. Now, so what, what the, the question is, why can't we do that? And one of the reasons is this, this path of, especially for neurotechnology, but for many devices, is going from the concept, which is emerging largely from universities, from research centers, uh, all the way through early stage prototypes, animal testing, human pilot trials, and finally into something that a company would say is attractive enough for them to be able to say, we want to commercialize this and make it available to people who really need it. That, that pipeline actually has a lot of holes in it. It has what's called the valley of death in which, uh, because we don't have all of the resources, that's in terms of people, the interdisciplinary teams, and quite frankly, the money to put all this together, a lot of these ideas die and they spend 10 years going from cursor control to robotic arm control. So the V Center is a new model in which we can bring together experts and technology and financial resources in order to not only sort of move things through this pipeline, but also be able to accelerate that development. So the, it, it made possible by a very generous gift from Hans-Jörg Wies, a Swiss philanthropist. Uh, we have moved into a wonderful new center in Geneva that is a new hub of neuroscience there, uh, which contains both academics and, uh, and uh, uh, other, other people. Uh, and um, what in the Wies Center, what we've done is really bring together a, a sort of unique clustering of people and technology and funding that I hope will be the accelerating force for this pipeline. So I think one of the innovations is the, the way we've structured the experts. So we have this vertically integrated team. So unlike businesses or academia where people of the same mind tend to work together, here we have uh, neuroscientists, engineers, clinicians, regulatory people, and even people from uh, project management and industry that are all working together, that they work as a team to help take that idea and bring it forward. In addition, we're very fortunate to have invested in technology that brings state-of-the-art engineering tools and state-of-the-art uh, neuroscience research tools so that we can develop new prototypes. We can test them even in humans. And where we can't do that, we have partnerships with leading industries uh, that we're forming now. And the idea is then when we can't solve a problem, we know who to go to in industry in order to solve that problem and bring innovation into it. And of course, thanks to Mr. Wies, we are uh, very fortunate to have a, a really generous gift so that we can support all of this. So let me give you an idea of the kinds of projects that we're uh, trying to support, we're beginning to support, and we've just started doing this. But of course, you've heard about the Brain Computer Interface Project, and that's one of the things uh, that uh, we're supporting with the V Center. Uh, in addition, we're supporting a project uh, on a bionic eye, uh, engineering genes to restore hearing, uh, stimulating the uh, virtual reality to combat pain, uh, brain stimulation to boost memory in Alzheimer's disease, 
reshaping the brain in dyslexia and engaging brain plasticity to recover or maximize or optimize recovery of function from stroke. We don't expect all of these things to work, but these, there are brilliant young academics that are pro providing us with the ideas that we're helping them to take it to become a real world solution. So I don't have time to talk about all of these. I'll just pick two. Uh, and one of them is dyslexia. So uh, dyslexia is a, uh, a reading disorder. Uh, and it is uh, in which uh, when, when people read, uh, it's a, in about 10 to 20 percent of children, you can, the words are not spaced correctly. So it's an interesting uh, and very puzzling kind of problem because what you see uh, when you look at this sentence that says the words are spaced correctly and what lands on the eye of a person with dyslexia is exactly the same. It's in the brain that this is broken up improperly so you get a perception of the words in a way that isn't orderly and doesn't make sense and so it makes it difficult and challenging to read. So in collaboration with uh, Anne-Lise Giraud, who's a faculty member at the University of Geneva and now a V scientist working with us, she had uh, an idea. She studied language for a long time. And what she found is that in, in us, we have this sort of rhythm in our brain, in the language areas of the brain, a kind of hum of the brain. Some people think it's just like the idling of your car, but she actually hypothesized, no, in fact, this might be the rhythm that helps us break up our words into phonemes or pieces that make sense to us. So she looked in dyslexics, and sure enough, she found that this rhythm is wrong. The rhythm is too fast. And so it led to the hypothesis that maybe what we could do is retrain the brain, come up with a device that will retrain the brain and stimulate it so that the frequency is shifted downward. And the idea, the hypothesis, is we'd be able to cure dyslexia. So this is an early stage project. It's just getting underway. There is a technology where we can now apply brain stimulation from the outside and we can try to oscillate. Do we know whether it will uh, actually drop the frequency down? No, we don't. But we have uh, the beginnings of technology and a very solid hypothesis from a very uh, bright scientist that will, will help us uh, go forward with this kind of a project. And we think if we can reshape brain ry rhythms in dyslexia, this might be applicable to a large number of other uh, disorders where the perception is disrupted. So, let me get back to BrainGate is another project I talk about. And one of the things you saw is that in, in the case of Kathy, you saw she has a plug on her head. She has this big electronics on her head. And she has this cable. And one of the reasons is that we have it that way is because the electronics the, the, is, is extremely sophisticated that we need to process all this information. We're basically working at internet speeds. And uh, there was no way to put this kind of technology inside the body. But working at the VIS, we have a project ongoing that will uh, allow us to develop the world's most sophisticated radio from the brain, uh, working at internet speeds. It will take the channels of information that we pick up from that tiny sensor and process it from a device that is implanted just under the skin on top of the skull, and it will broadcast out. And uh, one of the challenges here are enormous. One of the reasons why we didn't complete this, say, in an academic setting, is because not only does this have to have the most advanced electronics inside, very sophisticated radios, but it also has to have uh, materials that are safe for people. It has to have batteries that you can have inside under your skin that are safe. And these are challenges that most academics have no idea that you have to have titanium. This has a sapphire window. It has all kinds of complex technologies. But by bringing together the engineers and the scientists, we can really uh, tackle this problem. And we expect in two years, that uh, we'll have this, uh, uh, this, this device in humans and uh, an even better version of the device in a couple of more years after that. So I thought I'd end by uh, just uh, taking a message from Kathy and going back to say, well, from the patient's perspective, what would they like to see? So Kathy wrote me an email to tell me what she would like to see. She liked to garden and she liked to, uh, to do, uh, she liked to make red pepper relish was her favorite thing and she really missed that. She said, though, that even something simple like holding a book in her hands or even with a robotic hand would be a big deal for her. And then she said, as you recall, I said she can't speak. So she really didn't like the idea of not being able to speak. So in terms of her wishes, I think we're well on our way with a model like the VIS Center can provide to be able to provide Kathy at least with a robot arm to hold the book. But better than that, I hope we'll be able to restore movement to her arm. And with the skills and the knowledge that we gain from from doing this uh, project on her arm, 
maybe we can apply that same knowledge and be able to restore speech to Kathy and have a device that's not only available just for her, but something that's commercially available in the world to all of the people who need this kind of technology. So if we can succeed in that, then I think the VIS model is really something that really works and it'll, of course, make me extremely happy that we've put together a really creative and new and unique kind of environment. So thank you. John, it's um, brilliant and inspiring work. Um, so we're in a world where Moore's law continues, processing power keeps rising, miniaturization of sensors is still happening. Um, over the next five to 10 years, presumably the implantable devices will get smaller and more powerful. Is the limitation what we can understand about how the brain functions. Yes, so, so th there really is both. I think the, that you know, designing these devices that are better and better able to communicate and understanding the brain go hand in hand. We can't separate those two. There are, there's a challenge in the United States now to get rid of these kinds of implanted sensors and maybe pepper the brain with dust that will allow you to record all over the brain. And uh, then we'll put uh, that really how you separate them in the brain depends on our theory of the brain. I think one of the big revolutions in the past for four or five years is that instead of looking at the brain one cell at a time, it's really the community of networks that interact in the brain that has the message. How we study that is a big neuroscience question. If we crack that, then the sensors that the engineers can build us can tell us much more about how the brain is operating and we can make really even more and more sophisticated devices, which in fact what we're trying to do is to emulate the brain, make a piece when, the, when there's a piece of the brain missing, when there's a piece of the brain not operating properly, we're trying to make a technology that will replace that. And it's sort of a lot of hubris to say we can do that, but I think those two things working together, engineering and neuroscience can give us really a, a, a new insight, a new way to do this. Now science is quite messy and doesn't move in a linear direction. Yet a lot of people who have a family member who has a physical constraint will think, wow, this is my solution. This is what I've been waiting for. How much do you worry about creating unrealistic expectations in the potential patients? So we're very frank when we deal with each individual participant in a trial that, that we, you know, we are only promising that we will learn from them and we have learned tremendously from them, but we, we can't give them any direct benefit. It is really a, an ethical issue not to promise too much. I think there's a lot of hype around neuroscience and understanding the brain. Uh, I think uh, we're, those of us who dig deep inside the brain are very humbled by how little we really know. And so we do have to be extremely cautious that these are long-term events. Someday, you know, there are these breakthroughs that give us a step function improvement in understanding, but those are extraordinarily difficult to <laughs> predict, very difficult to know when those things come along. So whenever we're asked the question by Wired interviews or other press, that, that we, you know, they say, how long will it take? And I think we, we need to be very cautious as scientists to say, we just can't determine that. But I, I am very optimistic that in a decade, you know, there'll be people in the audience here who have some form of paralysis who will be maybe not typing on their computer but moving their mouse around and they'll be doing it with a brain gate like device. One final question. I'm getting tired typing messages onto this screen and Siri doesn't always understand what I mean. How long until you see healthy people wearing a little device that converts thought directly into text. So, so you, you would think that I would be the sort of big proponent of saying, you know, implant everybody in the brain. I have to say that, that hands are really extraordinary. Voices are really good at communicating. These have, you know, millions of years of evolution to, pr to really produce them. I think, no, the problem with voice is, of course, Siri doesn't understand that well, or if it's a noisy environment, uh, it, it's really a, a very difficult, uh, a bit difficult challenge. But I think there really is an extraordinarily big barrier between the time when we're sort of, you know, having lots of electrodes put into our brains, which unfortunately is probably the only way we can get that level of information. There's a really a big barrier to doing that. I have met one young gamer at Google who didn't care he would have had electrodes put anywhere in his brain. I think we're, most of us are not ready for that yet. I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg is working on it. Yes. Thank you very much from Geneva, yes, from the Wies Institute. John Donahue.